Welcome to Influential Entrepreneurs, bringing you interviews with elite business leaders and experts, sharing tips and strategies for elevating your business to the next level. Here's your host, Mike Saunders. Well, hello and welcome to this episode of Influential Entrepreneurs. This is Mike Saunders, the Authority Positioning Coach. Today we have with us Brad Formsma, who is the author of the best-selling book, I Like Giving, The Transforming Power of a Generous Life. And I really am looking forward to this interview. So, Brad, uh, welcome to the program. It's great to be here, Mike. Thanks for having me on. So I uh, I want to dive into the the concepts, but I always like to see what led someone up to um, you know that t- book topic or that business uh, focus that they're in. So uh, generosity and teaching people how to live generously. How did that uh, you know it probably if I'm uh, uh, kind of surmising correctly probably was a, a thread in your life and your business, and then it started getting you know more and more amplified, and then you started uh, kind of seeing that cause come to life, but give us a little bit of that background and what led you to write this book. Oh, sure. Well, I think we go back just a little bit, if I could, Mike. Uh, I was 11 years old, and my grandfather had a commercial bakery, and he would pick me up on Saturday mornings, and we would go into his test kitchen and make 16 special loaves of bread. And what would happen is those loaves of bread would cool off and go into the trunk of his car, and we would go to perhaps a, a widow from his church, and she'd get a few loaves of bread, and he would be generous in, with his words, affirming to her and kind. And So he was modeling generosity of words, and perhaps the next stop would be two more loaves of bread, and this time a white envelope, and he was modeling generosity of money. and so on and so forth. Like even throughout that morning, I remember a few more loaves of bread at another stop and a letter of recommendation helping someone through him being generous with his influence. And so he began to kind of frame up what I call seven ways to living generously. And uh, those are discussed in the book and I regularly speak about them in churches across America and in, you know, leading businesses. Because what we find is that those seven ways of being generous, which are generous of thought, generous with words, generous with money, generous with influence, generous with time, and then generous with attention, and generous in the way we share our stuff. And you take those seven ways and you start to see how they just weave through the daily, weekly, monthly rhythms of one's life. Uh, But then, Mike, I I kind of fast forward. I ended up going into business, not into my grandpa's. I started my own. I'm uh, kind of what I would describe as entrepreneurial spirit. Life passion is giving. Those would be my six words that kind of describe a little bit about me. And I had a business for nearly 20 years. And frankly, I was minding my own business. And one day on a run, I I got an impression that uh, very clearly had to do with uh, God getting ready to move my cheese, if you will. (laughs) Yeah, I remember that one. Um, Yeah, uh, I'll never forget it. On a run in Ada, Michigan, back when we lived in the great state of Michigan, uh, I got this impression I'm going to use you to encourage people in their giving, and you'll help inspire people to be generous, and you'll influence influencers with the message that it's better to give than receive. Um, and I, I didn't really know what to do with that, Mike. I, you know, I, I didn't even hardly leave for spring vacation because of the, the business that I had. But uh, that really moved us then to starting the organization I Like Giving. As we started to gather people to talk about generosity, we found that stories – connected with some scripture were a powerful way to move someone from awareness to action. And the result of that would be um, some incredible impact and kind of a miracle in that story. You know, I, I often say when, when we give, a miracle starting to happen because somebody probably was praying that God would provide or something like that. So uh, anyway, that's how we started the uh, organization I Like Giving with the soul vision to, hey, we're going to inspire people to live generously. Yeah. 
You know, I think I find it really interesting how sometimes people find this nugget of truth, and they and and uh, that becomes their next TEDx talk or the next wave in in personal development uh, circles that we see. But in reality, it was talked about in the twenties or thirties, or in reality, um, like what you were uh, just talking about in uh, uh, stories. Um, stories have been around for ages. Uh, Christ used parables to not sell concepts and beat someone over the head, but to bring a concept to life and make people kind of go, oh, yeah, that that does make sense. If you had just told me that fact, maybe it would not have resonated well. But I just think that it's so neat to see that, you know, there's there's truly, like Ecclesiastes says, no, nothing new under the sun, and we feel like story selling and storytelling is so new and cutting edge, but, yeah, it's been around for a minute or two. <laughs> Uh, for sure. I just got back from Israel. I had the opportunity to teach in Capernaum. And, you know, of course, that's where Peter's house was and where, where Jesus that was kind of his hometown for, yeah. you know, a couple of years, I believe, of his ministry. And so, you know, he was teaching around there. And so that was a super wonderful thing to be able to talk about biblical generosity uh, in a place where undoubtedly uh, the Lord did. And uh, and yet, uh, as as time has gone on, you know, I've always felt that the clear calling for our work would be one track into the marketplace, one track into the church. And part of it just makes sense, right? There's two days on the weekend where we can serve a local church. We're probably at 23 to 25 churches a year, and that's enough because I'd like to have my own home church as well. And my wife really appreciates that, by the way. She doesn't really like to go to church alone. So there's also those five days in the week that we can be in the marketplace. I often say not everybody goes to church, but most people go to work. And when you can appropriately talk about generosity principles that, for me, tie into their basis from the Bible in a marketplace environment, uh, not only are they great for people who work at those companies who are already of a faith perspective, uh, it's a powerful way for them to be able to express their faith with coworkers and have a jump-off point. So uh, that, that's what we do today. Neat. And, you know, I, I know that, uh, like you, you just said, it doesn't have to be a faith-based church um, organization or ministry. These principles of giving and generosity, love, all of that ties into just good business principles. And I also like the fact that you're not talking about giving as only money. That was just one of your seven. So let's uh, touch on a little bit a couple of the others where, you know, so many times um, we just feel like, like one of the ones you mentioned was time um, and attention. We're, we're busy, you know, to try to try to cram in one extra thing in the day sometimes is, you know, tipping the scales. So the the fact that someone can give of or um, provide attention in time is a pretty big uh, um, undertaking, and it really does make a good impact. So what do you teach around that concept? Well, the, the idea of being generous with attention uh, honestly, Mike, I kind of wish I wouldn't have put that one in there. <laughs> it's the <laughs> hardest one I'm fighting with right yeah. now. And I think it's because I carry around a cell phone, six ounces of glass, plastic, and technology. And it's the anti-generosity attention device. It just, it takes our attention. In fact, the other night I took my wife out on, for a nice dinner, date, you know, this is going great. And I... I looked around the, the room and I said to her, can you believe all of the people that have gone out to dinner with their cell phones? Yeah. And she said, like you? Ooh. Uh, and I'm like, oh, my word, you know, I didn't even see it. I'm so close to it. And, and fortunately, in that moment, many times I've not responded the best with that kind of uh, correction. She did uh-huh. it in love. She did it smiling. You can't yeah. see that over the radio waves, but what happens is we have created habits and we get kind of a, you know, hormone rush without getting overly technical when we get activated by looking at our device and, oh, someone wants me. Oh, there's something, there's something shiny and bright colors and, oh, I'm needed and, oh, I, you know, somebody wants me to connect with them. 
And even though you're sitting with someone right in front of you, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's horrible. So I don't say that in judgment to other people. I just say now that I told that story, I didn't even tell you to get off your phones at a restaurant, but I suspect the next time you're at a restaurant and you hold up your phone, you remember this story mm-hmm. and that searing word from my wife. <laughs> so I think that's one area. But I'll take you back to another story of uh, a generosity of attention. I don't know if I'll ever forget this. Had the privilege of being at Southwest Airlines headquarters and uh, was meeting with Herb Kelleher, who is their founder. And I don't know of a business leader and founder who took biblical principles and applied them to his business, while I'm not exactly sure where he actually came from, from a faith perspective, we never talked about those kinds of things, but he built a company on the golden rule. He built a company on people being respectful of each other and love, right? We, I mean, they're stock symbols, love. And we, I walked into his office. He's sitting behind his desk. He's smoking a cigarette. There's another one in the ashtray. He had smoked forever. And he would say funny things like, I just love the smell of smoke. I mean, the kid's mm-hmm. crazy. Anyway, he jumps up. I'm 6'4". I think he was 6'4". He comes around his desk and gives you this great big bear hug. I mean, I can hear the cigarette crackling over my shoulder. Oh, no. <laughs> and he looks right at my eyes. And he says, now, where are, you, where are you originally from? And between puffs of the cigarette, he was giving me 100% of his attention. And I'm like, this guy's got 45,000 employees. He's a multi-billionaire. And he mm-hmm. is all here. And we ended up in this great conversation. He would make it about you. He immediately went to, okay, now, where do you live today? Right, And he was looking to connect. And then, of course, he was funny. So he said, now, you lived in Michigan early on. You said, that means you're familiar with that airline, former airline, Northwest Airlines. Hmm. And I'm like, yeah, I, I, I remember them. I scraped them off my shoe, Herb, once I got you know, connected to Southwest. And he takes a big hit off of his cigarette, and he says, They thought they could compete with us by just buying aircraft. They forgot it was about the people. Yeah. Now, about this moment, Mike, his assistant's knocking on the door. Herb, you got a conference call? And he had some colorful four-letter words that we won't use, but he just said, I'm not doing it. I'm here with my new friend, Brad. Mm -hmm. And then he said, I want to get my picture with you. He says it to me. I'm going to get a picture with you. But I just got my hair cut. I come in here. They check my blood pressure. I mean, of course I don't have good blood pressure. I'm 86 years old, and I've been smoking for 50 years. What do you expect? And then he runs down the hallway and combs his hair and comes back. How do I look? Then we take a picture. He gave me, in a, in a matter of moments, 100% of his attention. And you don't forget it. Yeah. And so I think, I think we have an opportunity to give that and be fully present. And I would say, as impactful as that story is for a leader in business today to go, okay, I, I can do that, but it does not have to be every single interaction with every employee every single day. It could be um, consistently where you just watch for opportunity. So I feel like some people might be hearing this and going, well, I can't do that every single time someone comes to my office. And and I know that you're not saying to do that, but how do you find balance there? Yeah, so real simple. Um, I, I will quote Colleen Barrett from Southwest, who was also with us. She was the president for years. She says, I do what, for one, what I want to do for 50,000. See, if somebody comes up to you in your organization, and says, hey, I want I got this idea, whatever, and you're pressed for time, you're walking through the hallway, you're getting in the elevator. It's as simple as this. Hey, Joe, it sounds like that's a really good idea. I want to give it my full attention. Can you circle back with me tomorrow, and we can take three to five minutes to process that? And then you can move on. And people also have to understand what is their expectation. The, the point is this. You invest 
in giving your attention, you will reap getting attention. Yes. Where your focus is, there is, you know, uh, there, there's what's going to manifest because that is where you are uh, paying the most attention. And yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. So yeah, I you, spoke at a I spoke at a company called Do It Best. Uh, maybe you, you your audience would recall, you know, they have these different hardware stores all over the, the nation, and I had talked about being generous with words at work through not hitting send on an email or affirming someone with a specific connection to what they had done. And the powerful thing is, is that generosity of words, you, you start to, that affects your heart. You take that home. And I got a report back a week later, this guy was like, my wife keeps asking me, why am I being nicer to her with my words? What's going on at work? <laughs> and he said, oh, you know, this guy was in and he just explained how we could, you know, build people up or, you know, words mattered. And uh, so that's another way you, you had asked me about attention and words. So I, I think that is, um, I think that puts me in a lot of different corporate settings where people want me to help them reinforce the vision that's already there in the company. Yeah, neat. Um you know, I was thinking when you were talking a minute ago about, I always like to look at the other side of the equation, um, and we're talking about being generous, and I wonder if there is another side which um, kind of makes this kind of equation work, which is being willing to receive and being thankful so the person that you're being generous to for this to actually have a flow to work that person has to be in the mindset and the mode and the spirit of receiving because you know how some people can't even take a compliment so what do you find when someone tries to be generous giving you know time money attention all these things that we're talking about but then maybe that other party isn't really as uh, receiving as they could be how can that um, uh, part of the equation work well, if they work for me over time, if there's not change, they're just going to have to find another place to give their life away. I mean, you know, <laughs> it sounds like a cultural issue on one hand. But the other thing I would ex explain is one day I was get, picking up my dry cleaning with my daughter. It was hot. The air conditioner wasn't working at this air con uh, at the dry cleaner. And there was uh, three people back, Mr. Arms Crossed. You can tell he was... He was hot, but it wasn't the temperature. It was just his attitude. Things weren't moving fast enough. And uh, I had over the years gotten to know the lady, Rosa, and, and so I just said, hey, Rosa, how many people are working here? And I had my 10-year-old with me, and she said, oh, there's four of us today. And so we walked out, and my daughter says to me, I know what you're going to do. We're going over to Chipotle next door and getting them some iced teas, aren't we? And I said, oh, of course, 100%. <laughs> we had our antenna work, and we saw that. So we came back in, now Mr. Armscrossed, we came back in with the ice peas. Mr. Armscrossed is next in line. We put the ice peas on the counter. Rosa smiles. The people in the back are smiling and waving. And his hands fall to the side. He leans forward. He even smiles. You see, what happens is over time, when we give and live generously, it impacts people. The way we were created, this is biologically speaking, when you give, when you receive, and when you observe, your body produces dopamine, oxytocin. It, you feel better. You get in connection with it. It's just how God set it up. I'm just, just saying. And so as, as we go out and give, does everybody receive well? No. I actually have a chapter about that in my book. Because receiving is very hard in this independent American culture. However, over time, you can't fight the forces of what's happening in your wiring. Yeah. Um, it makes me also think of something. Uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, we're funny. talking about so many deep, deep things here. Um, Here's something that um, I, I find when we start thinking about, you know, giving and generosity and, and like Bob Berg talks about in the book Go-Giver, um, this is a new philosophy for so many people. They, they might 
I think they've heard it before, but they haven't really, you know, internalized it and, and implemented it. But I feel that there's people that might say, I can implement this in my personal life, my business life, um, but what's in it for me? What, what's, the, what's the give back? And, and how do you get people to get past the feeling of, well, if I do this, then I should get whatever, you know, fill in the blank? Uh, you know, I just don't subscribe to the give to get. I can't find it anywhere. Yeah, um, I can't but it's human nature. Isn't it? buy in. Uh, it's human nature until you cross over and realize the truth that you reap what you sow. And I think if if we're going to be talking about Jesus of Nazareth, we have to understand his message had a lot to do with what is your motive for doing what you do. And so I think, you know, this all comes back to the heart issue, right? So it's the heart issue is why would, I, why would I think in terms of give to get? Of course, there are some people who would say, oh, well, you have to understand, you know, the Bible says in Luke, give and it should be given, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Well, yeah, I, I often think God brings it back. My grandpa, who he started this conversation with, would say, behind the big plume of cigar smoke, Bradley, giving is good, and God often brings it back so you can do it again. <laughs> and I think that's more of the mindset. As you begin to live generously and are outwardly focused, you know, you're going to see you're going to change. The Brad of 10, 15, 20 years ago is very different than the Brad of today. This isn't once and done. and I didn't transform in one hour on this, and I continue to grow in it, right? The, the Bible says grow in the grace of giving, not grown, you're done, it's over. And so I think it's a, a perpetual process and journey. Yeah. Yeah, and the, the you know the old cliche: "You're in for a thousand steps, be, uh, or a thousand miles begins with the first step." And how do you get an elephant? All of that, and and I think that a lot of p- people see this big picture of that feeling of giving generosity, gratitude, and kind of that changing of mindset. Um, it doesn't have to happen overnight because you are in the condition you're in now of maybe not following these principles, um, but you don't need to change and be perfect tomorrow morning. It needs to be that gradual progression. So I like I like that point that you that you made. So let's wrap up with what's the best way that people can reach out, learn more, uh, pick up a copy of your book, uh, pick up a copy of your course, and and how could that uh, uh, connection be made? Well, ilikegiving.com is a great place to start, and uh, bradformsma.com is where you'll see uh, information on my upcoming podcast starting in 2020. And uh, you never know, Mike. Maybe what? Well, maybe I'll be at your church in Denver. We're not too far away. Neat, and, awesome. Uh, so I think those would be the ways that uh, you could connect with us. Of course, we're on Insta and and Twitter, and other social channels as well. You've been listening to Influential Entrepreneurs with Mike Saunders. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit www.influentialentrepreneursradio.com.